Hello everyone and thank you for joining. We will get started in just a few minutes. We're just going to let others join us and get situated. Welcome to today's webinar, Reasons You're Failing at Observability and What to Do About It. My name is Becky and I'll be your moderator today. We're excited to have Aryo Asara, co-founder and CEO of Corelogix, and Mirko Novakovic, co-founder and CEO of Instana with us today. Before I hand over to our speakers, I have a few housekeeping items to cover regarding today's webinar. First, this webinar will be recorded and available on demand after the live session. It will also be sent to you via email or you can access this through Instana's website. We'd love to hear from you during today's presentation. And if you have any questions for our speakers, please feel free, free to send them through the chat box on the right hand side. We'll be answering questions during the presentation where possible and we'll do our very best to cover any at the end. If we miss your question, please don't worry. We'll be sure to follow up with you afterwards. Without any further ado, I'd like to kick things off by handing over to our speakers. Thank you. Uh, as always, I want to first maybe introduce myself. I'm co-founder and CEO of Instana, uh, and I'm happy to have you here in this webinar. And I'm also happy to have Ariel on this webinar. Hi, Ariel. Maybe you present yourself. I'm okay. How, how, uh, how are you doing? And uh, thanks for having me here as a guest. Um, happy to talk some observability with uh, one of the leading uh, companies in that space. <laughs> thanks, Ariel. And uh, so uh, for, for the webinars, the concept we always had in these webinars is to keep it more like a conversation and less like a presentation. You have this chat on the right side. So whenever you want to ask questions, just ask them right away and we will try to integrate them into the conversation and answer them or keep this conversation going. I think that's always the best way to uh, have this. And our today's topic, as you heard, is reasons why we are failing with observability. And we will probably go through that topic by explaining what observability is, what you need. And of course, also, as, as you can see here, I, 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 we are an APM vendor in Stana and uh, we work with everything around your application so uh, we have the metrics and the traces and application stats and and we will walk you through how how we solve observability for you how we, how we can help and uh ariel maybe you just introduce a little bit about who you are and what you do with CoreLogix. and uh, i know you're in tel aviv today I, I see a little bit of the town and maybe the sea not yet but uh it, it, it's a very nice place yeah, um, so I'm the CEO of CoreLogix. Uh, we uh, basically do modern logging. So logging built for cloud companies, companies performing uh, CI, CD, um, all the way from the collection to uh, learning the data behavior and benchmarking every deployment to production. Um, we will also talk about how CoreLogix and Instana integrate with each other to give you the complete observability picture that you need for your uh, modern organization. That sounds good. Um, so, Mirko, you, you want to start with uh, Instana a little? Well, I think let's let's go with CoreLogic. I will I will show the pro a little bit later. I, I'm really interested in hearing how how you do it. Uh, so, so let's go let's go to the previous slide, and I'll start uh, explaining about the company a little. So, um, we collect all your logs. It doesn't matter uh, the format, um, the structure, or, or the source. Um, it's very easy to integrate. We have over 100 integration with uh, different platforms and also 
Um, the common ones that you probably know, like Logstash, FluentD, Filevi, and so on. Um, and then uh, we start processing the data in a way that is more fit for a modern organization, specifically organizations uh, working uh, uh, with microservices performing CI CD. Uh, the first step is we automatically cluster the data in ingestion. So we understand the different uh, uh, patterns of data, uh, what types of unique logs you have in your system. And then the next step is we automatically learn that data behavior, whether it's uh, cross uh, uh, service flows, uh, logs going from one service to another um, and creating a logical flow, uh, whether it's uh, trends of errors or uh, API uh, responses and so on. And then we integrate into the CI CD pipeline to extract a tag on any change due to your production and automatically benchmark that version's quality based on uh, our continuous learning of your system. So we know exactly how the system should behave and then use the tags as uh, points in time to compare and basically understand that in the latest version, new errors were created, uh, new flows were broken or uh, tra uh, trends of errors uh, were created. And in the next slide, um, this is uh, 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 more about our data pipeline, which is very uh, uh, different in the market. Um, so we basically allow our company, our customers to pay per value and not only per volume. So a lot of the times in the logging market, you'd pay per gig, no matter what it is that you do with your log. And CoreLogix lets our uh, uh, customers break down the data for different use cases, whether it's uh, frequently searched raw data, um, monitoring and compliance use cases. Um, and then you, as you can see here in this uh, nice uh, subway map, the data goes through different pipelines, different stations, according to the customer preferences. And obviously the price per gig varies uh, per use case. And so uh, customers can basically get a much better coverage of their production, not having to think whether they wanna send um, specific data or not, um, because they can uh, adjust how uh, deep the data is processed and pay by that. So that gives better coverage and basically getting insights without paying for noise. Um, so that is uh, CoreLogix. Um, we're now expanding into um, security and uh, uh, launching also an integration with uh, Grafana and Matrix. I, I have a question for you, Ariel. And, and that's sure. one I always have if I think about logs, right? Do you have any idea how what a percentage is really hot and what percentage is noise? Because my feeling is with logs, it's like 99% noise, right? Because uh, you have these logs and it all comes in and you are interested in a few of them, but it it's a lot of noise, right? So do you have any feeling or is, is, is that correct or not? You're, so uh, it's uh, not by chance that I mentioned one of the leading companies in the observability space. Your, your assumption is exactly uh, correct. It's, uh, there's a research by IDC that was made and then published by Cisco that 99.5% of events are never searched or processed. Um, we've done a little research on uh, about 1,800 customers that we serve today and found that only 2.5% of the data is in severity error or critical. And most of the data is a lot of verbose data, a lot of info data. Uh, web servers generate a lot of 200s that people don't really utilize or search, but they still want to visualize and alert on you know, deviations from what they, they expect. Um, so definitely most of the data is not really used. And that's why we came up with this model because we felt like you know, if you're going into the supermarket and you just fill your bag and when you leave, someone weighs that bag and he doesn't even care what's inside and says, that's gonna cost you $10. And it doesn't matter what you pick up. So we said, okay, there has to be a different price for you know, the most uh, verbose log in your staging and the most important stack trace in your production. And that's why we created this uh, uh, pipeline model. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and I think also I see this logs to metrics, and I know that we will talk about that. How you can also, if you want to derive metrics, right? For example, how many two hundreds I had, then you kind of need the logs anyway, right? Because you have to have that data to create these logs. It's very similar to traces, by the way, that we do. A lot of the traces you will probably also never look at. You only want to see the critical ones, right? The slow ones, the erroneous ones, 
but you still need them for a few of these derived metrics uh, that you have. That's that's interesting. It will be interesting to to get into more detail. Detail. Yeah, and we have prepared a few questions that we want to take, and I, I hope for more questions here from from the audience. But I want to start today's topic is uh, why failing at observability. And, and one of the questions I have for you, Ariel, is what, what is observability for you, right? It's kind of the new trend word in our space and everybody has a different definition. And uh, yeah. so give it your, give, give us your definition. So the, uh, uh, basically what a lot of companies had done is go through the website and find and replace every play, everywhere they said monitoring to observability and that's that ended there. That's what um, we did. <laughs> <laughs> we actually didn't use observability in the website yet. So it's a good point. I'll, I'll note this to do that find and replace. But the idea about observability and why it's so different than everything that's happened until now um, is that observability lets you basically ask any question that you'd like. Um, having the data in the right way and structure and having the mapping, and that goes really well with traces that basically give you the service map and, and the dependencies um, and then logs enrich that with a lot of context because people are very much uh, story driven and lets you basically ask any question that you'd like. So uh, instead of being driven by here are things that I anticipate and I want to set the alert to be notified whenever they happen. Um, you want to build this nice pool of data and context that allows you to uh, say uh, what could go wrong that would cause something to happen. One of my customers complaining, I get uh, an alert from one of my monitoring, standard monitoring that is still important. Now I want to be able to ask questions that lets me uh, uh, get further context and drill down into either that service that is problematic or cross uh, 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 affecting services around it. Um, so that's that's my point of view. How do you look at it? I think I, I, I like it. I, I mean, if you re read about it, I think one one thing that's obvious, and, and this is what you said, right? The unknown unknowns, right? Monitoring was and is about monitoring what you already know you want to look at, right? Like the CPU of a server or uh, these things, that's something you know you want to monitor, right? Where observability comes in when there are these unknown unknowns, right? You haven't even thought about that problem or that metric or uh, uh, or that trace, but now you, you have this problem and you need to debug or slice and dice that problem uh, as a post-mortem or life in production. And that's where observability really comes into play, right? And, and uh, I, I like to say it's also about the why, right? Understanding the why something happened where monitoring is more like the what, right? What's, yeah. what, what's in the system and you can analyze the why very well with uh, observability tools. And I honestly think, I mean, we, we vendors, we like to make every problem a tool problem, right? And uh, uh, which, which is awesome for us because then we have the solution for the problem, right? But I obviously also think that, and, and that would be interesting to hear from you, that observability is a mindset thing too, right? It also, I mean, logs are not coming from uh, uh, automatically, especially not in applications. Developers have to put meaningful logs into their code. And also with tracing, there is, there is some automation, but you can also enhance traces by adding parameters, by using open source, things like open tracing or open telemetry. So I think the way you basically put observability into your code is also changing and and without that any tool i mean if there are no logs core logic also cannot help right so it's yeah. it's 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 not only about the tool it's also about a mindset and a change how you work and how you build observability and monitoring into your code in, in into your you know company's culture to some extent i agree and I, but i think it's it's some sort of snowball uh, once you set the tooling right, and once you uh, uh, start talking about it and, and gaining that culture, um, basically when people start getting value from it, they understand, wow, if I didn't have this trace here, if I didn't have this log here, I wouldn't be able to solve this right now. And then on the, the next time that they develop something, something themselves or when they improve their infrastructure, they're going to be a lot more uh, uh, minded to that. So yeah, I definitely agree. 
And then the question is, uh, why, why do you think we even need observability now? It's a good question, right? And why now, right? I mean, yeah. uh, I, I'm in this monitoring space forever, right? Late 90s, and we always had monitoring. Nobody ever asked for observability. So the good question, why now, right? And, and uh, of course, we've prepared the slide for that, right? To, to discuss what are the changes that are happening and driving this. And I, I, I will just start with something that's important for us and which led me in 2015 really found Astana and because I thought there is a big change happening that needs a new set of tools. And, and when we started, I was really focused on that technology change that was happening and architecture change, right? People started using microservices, so they split up things into smaller pieces, independent pieces. And then when containers came up and Docker and then Kubernetes, they started also executing or, or, or deploying these things these microservices in a different way and scheduling it in a different way. And I think while this is very nice, it also adds a lot of complexity, right? And, and if we come back to what we said initially, with monitoring, you have to know what you want to see. If things get very complex, then it's also really hard to know upfront what you re really want to look at, right? And that's why things like dashboards classical things like dashboards, et cetera, and monitoring, they kind of fail in these environments because the number of metrics, logs, and traces are just too many to put them on a single dashboard. And if something fails, it's also oftentimes like finding the needle in the haystack, right? It's, it's just a lot of complexity. And, and, and that's where I think one of the reasons why observability came up is because people figured out, oh my God, I built this monster, right? <laughs> with with all these connected microservices, and now I need something that helps me figure out uh, how how to solve problems and issues in these environments, right? So I think that's one trigger, and and maybe you can take one of the other things here to explain why this is also important, right? Yeah. So uh, I think the, the the frequency of of deployments um, just changed dramatically. We see companies deploying many versions. Uh, some of our customers are deploying over 100 versions every day to production. And you see that, you see a company with like two, three, four hundred uh, R&D engineers. And you're saying this is a chase that can never, like the SRE DevOps teams, they can never win. Because if there are 300 people um, creating uh, microservices and features and four or five, ten people creating dashboards and alerts to follow them, they're basically in the dark. So there's no way to do that. And then the best way is to say, okay, I'm going to get such good observability into this uh, uh, um, organization and create, create some kind of centralized platform that sends um, the data from all of the microservices, all of the infrastructure into a, a single system and map everything and have this culture inside my organization. I can answer, like you mentioned, the unknown unknowns. So a microservices that was brought up yesterday and suddenly uh, creates a cross effect on another microservice, your ability to monitor this. And by the way, don't even try. Like, it's, it's like you, if, if you look at testing world in the past, we used to call it uh, exhaustive testing. This is exhaustive monitoring. Like, you just create so many dashboards and alerts, you start uh, 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 an alert fatigue in your organization, and then a lot of good engineers are just not going to stick around, and, and they're right. Hey, we have a really good question here. I think that comes to the middle of this thing too, right? The organizational changes. And there are a few, I think there are two questions here, which I, I, I would uh, like to thank. Thank you, Parveen, for asking. Is one, who is, for who is observability, right? Who, who needs this? And the other thing I think that's in here is, is SREs, right? What, what are SREs and how how do they play into, into that observability play, right? For, for, so, so do you want to start? Who, who needs observability? It's, it's a good point. I think that um, any organization that has mo a modern architecture, um, microservices, cloud, and so on, uh, CI, CD for sure, is like I mentioned, like we mentioned now, monitoring is just not up to pace and, and he needs better observability tools. Um, my opinion, and I'm very actually interested to hear yours here, Mirko, is that SRE is great, but um, it reduces a lot of responsibility inside the organization. 
and makes this uh, you know notion of let's create, deploy, and then forget. And when you talk about who needs observability, it's the entire organization. Any developer needs observability into the system while developing, in staging, and definitely in production. Because the last thing you want to you want to hear is the SRE calling you in the middle of the night saying, "Hey, this crisis has been ongoing for an hour. We weren't able to solve it because we don't have monitoring or a runbook. Let's uh, you know join us and help." So I think the entire organization and any organization, but more specifically, uh, companies, uh, uh, more modern online companies doing CI/CD. Yeah, I would, I would, I, I wouldn't challenge that a bit, but I think with the shift left, I, I would say, uh, is it only for devs? Probably not, but it is primarily for devs, in my point of view. And the reason for that is that. Just from my experience, I before I founded Instana, I was a consultant. I was in many projects, and 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 uh, I think it is really hard for somebody who has not developed something to ask the right question, right? So with monitoring, it is easy, right? Because it's predefined. So you're looking at things. So an ops guy or or you know, and 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 SREs can easily look at it and they understand it. It is kinds of things they know, right? Let's take an easy example, CPU or whatever. Everybody understands that, right? But now if you go to observability and you really slice and dice the data with things that the developer has put in, it is really hard for somebody else than that concrete developer to ask that question. And that's, that's kind of why I think observability is really a powerful tool for developers it can be helpful for SREs too if they have a lot of knowledge about the system and 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 uh, uh, the insights of the system. But I think one of the primary uh, uh, roles who is really using observability, and it's one of the reasons I think it came up now, right? Because of this shift left, because we are shifting more responsibilities to the developer. They needed more specific tools to their needs which kind of observability gives them, right? The, the ability to do debugging, which you did on your laptop before, now you're basically doing the same thing in production, right? And you need to understand exactly what's happening there to really get all the value out there, right? I, I, I think, of course, it's helpful for everybody, but I think it's especially observability without the monitoring part, right? I think it's, 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 it is a developer tool, right? Or a developer-centric tool that's that's used mostly by developers. So I know for Instana, 65% of our users are developers, and then 35% of the users are basically divided into SREs, ops people, DevOps engineers, and also product managers or, or product owners who want to see how their product is working in production, right? But it's yeah. it's more like like two thirds of, of 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 the users are are developers. Interesting. So that, that also explains the point of view. I think in logs, we have a, a bit of a different use case. So uh, we see a lot of support engineers, a lot of product managers, a lot of data scientists, and uh, recently a lot of uh, 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 security engineers, um, so security analysts and so on, because the way we see it in cloud, security is part of the observability cycle. Is part of your production. A lot of problems can be related to security issues or attacks or suspicious activity. Let's say you have latency in one of your apps. There's there are good odds or there are odds that this is related to security. So we see a broad use case across the organization. But I do tend to agree that still the mass is is definitely R and D DevOps SRV. Another really good question is one, uh, by the way, Praveen, thanks a lot. It's one of my favorite questions as a vendor, right? Especially if you do automation is, um, is a really good thing. It is how, how much, and, and then uh, uh, the next thing is about sidecars. I think both topics are really interesting, right? One yeah. of the things is if you add tracing, for example, so you add trace or also logs, right, into the code, it adds a performance overhead independently from the pattern like sidecore or not be because like just creating a log string with parameters and logging it somewhere adds a certain amount of overhead right so uh adding too much can add in high scale can add a significant amount of overhead right we have customers 
on, on large scale that measure that. And it, ha it is a big cost, right? I have to say that not a lot of customers do really measure that because it's just part of the code. But yeah. I would agree that um, it can definitely infect instrumentation, can definitely uh, impact your application performance in a negative way. And you also have to really understand how to do logging or tracing uh, to, to basically reduce the overhead to a minimum, right? Because you can do it in a way that it's really harmful to your performance and you can do it in a way where uh, it doesn't, right? And with a sidecar pattern, which, which probably is something that you see in, 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 in a Kubernetes environment or in, in uh, service meshes a lot, where you basically in the pods deploy something like a sidecar, which will handle basically transferring the data from the process to, for example, CoreLogic or Instana, and that basically doing this in a separate process will then basically reduce the overhead, at least from a transportation and IO perspective in that case. So it can help, but it doesn't reduce the overhead on the instrumentation side, right? Which is in the code and it adds overhead, it can add objects, it can create more garbage to a garbage collector, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not sure you see it, but I think it is something you really have to be careful with to not overuse it uh, uh, in, 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 in certain situations. So there, there are two sides to this. First, you don't want to be too verbose. That is correct. On the other hand, you know, if you think about the past, like 10 years ago, uh, 10, 15 years ago, uh, developers would be very careful on the size of a single log. So they try to write a very narrow log overhead. Today, our suggestion is to add as much content as you can. By the way, one thing that can really improve um, um, the performance hit is using standard loggers that help you bulk the data, write it to different destinations in an organized way, and they're optimized for performance. So that is correct. And by the way, I agree with your um, assumption or experience here that logs, just like you know, if you look at open tracing or other uh, ways of instrumenting uh, 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 traces, people, when it's part of the code, they don't really measure it. When it's not an agent that they can measure, they don't really get into it. Um, so we're not facing it too much, but handled properly, by the way, zipped also to save network, um, that, that, that the performance hit is, uh, to my opinion, less, uh, less important than the, the benefit that you get. So don't write overly verbose logs, but don't, don't save on important data because you're afraid of uh, performance. I see another yeah. question. We have the next question. Thanks, Nasser, for, for that question. It's, it, I, I think it's also a really interesting question and, and not that easy to answer in my point of view. And, and the question is, is basically observability monitoring on steroids, right? So is it kind of the evolution getting from monitoring to observability as the next step? So is it, is it monitoring on steroids? What do you think, Ariel? I, I like to use analogies all the time. So when people ask me about observability versus monitoring, I always say it's like having um, an alarm system in your home or having video cameras 24 seven in your home. If you have an alarm system, you uh, uh, get like a text saying someone broke to your home and you don't know where, you don't know how, you want to, you want to understand who this is, you need to get there or send the police or something. When you have video cameras everywhere and every, everything is covered, then you just open up your laptop and you see, okay, he broke through that window, he's in that room, he's going to my safe. And, and it's a much, you can ask different questions. You can go room by room and try to understand what's, what's the root cause. So I, would, I wouldn't call it monitoring on steroids. Um, I would define this as a way of uh, uh, debugging, of creating a story. And the human brain was not built for matrix and alarms. It was created to read and interpret and understand stories and follow leads. And when you have those traces, those events that let you build that story in your head and make assumptions and ask questions, you get faster, more reliable results. So that's the that's way I, I look at it. What about you, Matt? I come back to this metric point later. Uh, that's, that's interesting. But I, I would also answer in a similar way. And I like your analogy, by the way, with the cameras. 
But that kind of also implies that in a certain way it is monitoring on steroids, right? In, in terms of, I know this as a vendor, right? The amount of data you have pr to process and you have shown your processing pipeline and how you put things together and why you are distinguishing between hot and not so hot data, right? Because if you just have a few alerts and metrics, that doesn't really matter, right? But if you have all these video streams, it's very similar. Maybe you only want to see the two minutes where, where somebody broke into your house or, or the cat went out of the door or whatever. So uh, it is something that is really complicated, right? Because you have a lot of data structured and unstructured, right? And you have to figure out basically what the data is you really want to look at, right? Either you as a vendor have to do it or the user has to ask the right questions, right? So I would, that's why I said it's so hard to answer, right? It's kind of monitoring steroids, but I would also agree with the analogy. You could also say it's a different use case, right? So you still need the monitoring. So observability, observability does not replace monitoring, right? It, but it, it's kind of, it needs more data is a little bit more complicated, I think. So it, it's, I think it's hard to answer that question, right? I, in, I agree. In that yes. It doesn't replace monitoring. Any tool that calls itself observability still has anomaly detection and alerting and everything. It's not, it's not a replacement. Yeah, that's a really good point. Hugo, thanks for the question. That's, that's also a good point, right? Should I aggregate all the data on the same place? as house or each room should have its own database. So when you observe, you don't that noise from the other rooms. That's a very good question. I can, do you want to start Ariel? I can answer it later for, for Instata. We have a concept for that uh, and, okay. and how we think about it. And, and uh, I can also explain how customers do it. Cool. So first of all, I'm very happy to see that the analogy was adopted. It's pretty cool. <laughs> um, I, so we actually offer both ways and different customers do this differently. We offer customers to open separate teams to separate applications, or we offer them to store everything in the same account and label it under different application name or component name. Um, the use cases are different. So it's much dependent on whether these are interacting or not or affecting one another or not. If you have a whole, if one of the rooms is completely separate from, from the, the, the house, and has a separate exit and nothing that happens, that room has a, a locked door. You can't walk out, you can't break into that room and get into the house. So you probably want it on a separate account. It has separate needs, sometimes separate users. But if that room is interconnected to the rest of the house and um, you suddenly see someone walking in your living room, you wanna be able to see the same stream and see him breaking into uh, that room and then walking into the living room stealing your, your TV. Uh, so that if we keep that analogy. Another, you know, uh, another thing to take in, into consideration here is, is, is uh, data retention policies, security uh, uh, permissions, and so on and so forth. Sometimes you don't have a choice. If one of your environments is PCI and you need to keep data for a year, and the other one is just a web server and you want to keep it for five days, some, sometimes there's no other choice other than separating. In general, most use cases that I've seen, you want everything centralized, at least with log data. How is it with, with traces, Mirko? Yeah, I, so first of all, I, I would agree with everything you said. It's very similar for us, but let's, let's start with, I would first start, I would always start by putting everything in one place, right? So uh, separation for me should only happen if there is a real reason for it. And you named a few, right? Security could be a problem, right? Because if you have uh, a, a room where somebody doesn't is not allowed to enter that room, they shouldn't see the camera picture, right? And then you maybe need to separate it. You can do that by separating the databases, but you don't have to, right? Because you could only you could also limit the access. The problem yeah. Yeah. with having data in separate databases yeah. is that normally you cannot aggregate that data easily, right? You cannot make a join or whatever between two different data sources. And that's something maybe you want to see, right? If you want to ask uh, in which room was the cat yesterday, right? But you have the rooms in separate databases, then you have to basically do this 
uh, to every single yeah. database and you cannot really do this uh, 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 in one place, right? So it's, it, it gets more complicated, maybe even impossible in some cases. So separating data can have issues, but there can be really good reasons to do it, right? Because it could be that you are serving two different customers and they don't want to have the data in the same database, right? Or there could be other reasons of, of uh, uh, separating data. So I would say uh, we support both, but we always recommend customers to start with one instance, right? And only split them up when they really need it, right? Hope that answers the question, Hugo. And I see another one by Aiden. What are your thoughts on using on tools for observability or is having best of breed still the best practice? Who? That's a hard, a tough question for us. Uh, so first of all, let me maybe give a little bit context about this, right? I think uh, the question is, there are best of breed vendors. And I would say, um, Ariel, we are, part of that best of breed tools, right? You are a logging solution. We are an APM vendor. So uh, if, if you ask us as a vendor, I would say we'd say best of breed is really good, right? So that's best of breed. But then there's also uh, tools that have everything, right? And you can see it's kind of always marketed as the three pillars, right? Maybe having logs, metrics, and traces, and whatever in one tool. And, and to be really fair, I think there are reasons for both, right? Let me, let me explain. I think every vendor, when they start, as, as we did, has kind of a DNA and where they are really good at, right? And uh, I would say what we are really good at at Stana is application performance management, right? We are really good at instrumenting code, doing traces, profiles, understanding the performance of an application. We can also do metrics, for example, infrastructure, but that's not our core DNA. We just do it because we have to, because we need the data, right? And I would say, Ariel, what, what you are doing is your, your DNA is logs, right? You, you're really, really good in logs. And, and so that's kind of the best of breed approach, right? We want to be the best in our category. And getting back, if you have everything in one tool, I would argue that uh, in each category in that tool, they are kind of good enough, but not really the best. And, and from my experience, there are two types of customers, right? There are customers who prefer one tool instead of three tools, for example, and then they accept that they only have a good enough tool, but it's good enough for them, right? And then there are other types of customers who say, no, I want the best tool for each category. I want the best logging tool, the best APM tool, and for example, the best infrastructure tool and then uh, uh, separate between this, right? And so that's uh, uh, how I see it in the market. And that's how also how different vendors position themselves in that place. And I don't think that there is a, um, there is a, there is a clear answer to that, right? It's really about what you want to do, who the user is. And uh, I, I also see that we have uh, different kind of, you said, uh, Ariel, that you're also going into security. You see that a lot with logging, and then you are more on the security team side. So it's really dependent on the certain use cases. And um, that's how I would answer that question. So there is not really a, is best of breed or one tool the better option? I think uh, it's really a little bit dependent on your requirements and uh, uh, the user type. I agree. I think I think that um, APM and uh, um, logs being the more complicated uh, problems in, in, in observability are um, areas where you need a company that is really focused. So my opinion is, um, like you mentioned, you can get a platform that is good enough, but our, our companies are good examples of uh, one company that excels major, uh, 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 traces and APM and one company that excels logs and events. And we both meet with, monitor, with uh, uh, infrastructure uh, monitoring and matrix for uh, uh, not our strength. Um, so we need their data. I want to complete logs with that, but we're not stepping into APM, which is a very complex problem to solve. So it, I think it depends on the maturity of an, of an organization. A mature organization that wants to achieve more and wants not to you know, only set up a spaces, but get deep into uh, uh, data and, and 
and really analyze things in depth. It takes some hit to not have everything in the same place, but the better solution would be um, to go with best of read. If you're starting your way in the monitoring and observability uh, world, maybe starting with like a platform that gives you everything good enough, and then from there moving to the next step is a better uh, idea for you. And we'll talk in, in a few minutes about how we try to bridge that uh, CoreLogics and Instana together. Sure. Thanks for that. Right. And and we have three more questions. I start with the first one. Yeah. Andrew, thanks for, for asking. Is observability primarily for microservice-based applications, or is it also useful in monolithic apps? Right. Good question. Should I start? Do you want Ariel? You yeah, go. No. Okay. So here, here's my point of view, right? Um, when I started in this whole space, for example, in APM, an application basically looked like this. You had an application server, and that that was, at that time, mostly something like WebSphere or WebLogic. And then you had a database, mostly Oracle or DB2, right? So an application basically looked like this. A user does something, calls that application server application, then calls a database. So if you look at monitoring, it worked pretty well, right? Because it was super predictable what's happening, right? You kind of learned what metrics to look at on the web sphere, on your database. You had uh, a very specialized groups. You had the database uh, guys who understood Oracle or DB2 really well, and they had specialized tools. So it was kind of monitoring worked in that environment, right? When, when we go to microservices, that approach doesn't work anymore because, as we said, the complexity is just too big. So the way I would answer that question is with microservice ap application, you need observability. You cannot work with monitoring only, right? Yeah. Where with monolithic application, I would say monitoring worked for the last 20 years and, and, and there was no demand for observability, though I have to say, that observability still can add some value in these environments, but it's not as important as it is for microservice applications. So I would say, to answer the question, I think it is primarily for microservice application, and that's where the real value comes from, or, or is, is in observability, but it's also useful in monolithic apps, but it's not primarily built for monolithic apps. That's how I would, See, yeah, see, I, I, yeah, right. I agree. Like uh, my short answer would be, it's a nice to have for monolithic apps, and it's a must-have for microservices. Um, and if again, it's it's about the maturity of the, the organization. If monitoring works perfectly for a monolithic uh, 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 application, to add an observability layer into it and gain more insights and optimize more is a great idea. Um, but if it doesn't work, you probably want to set your monitoring straight first. In microservices, you want to start with, and that goes to another question we have uh, along, you want to start with an observability culture because it's very hard to build that after you're far along the way. Like Mirko mentioned, you know, if the traces are not there, if the matrix, the custom matrix are not there, if the logs are not there, um, it's going to be hard uh, uh, to, to go back and fix that. Yeah. Thanks, Andrew, for the question. So Ron has the next question, which is also not an easy one, right? Proprietary or open source? What will provide the best observability solution? And I, I would start by distinguishing between a, a few things. I think there is a part where open source definitely is very important for observability, and that's when it comes to data gathering uh, and uh, things like uh, 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 getting traces or putting your traces in or putting your locks in. I, I saw, Ariel, you were talking about FileBeat and these things, which are open source products which generate locks. There's also things like Prometheus. If you have something like Kubernetes and you want to get metrics, there's a ton of really useful metrics already built into the products using the metric standard of Prometheus or there are tracing solutions like open telemetry, open tracing, which are really useful if you want to instrument your codes in a non-proprietary way. So I think on that side, open source is kind of uh, the default, I would even say, for developers to do that. And it does not make too much sense to do propriety, except for maybe very edge use cases where you need propriety because uh, the standard open source tools do not provide 
what you need, right? That's that's on the data side. Then on the backend side, I think it really depends on your skill set too, right? Because operating uh, things like I, I would say you today you can build your own logging solution, right? It's possible. There are some open source components out there, but everybody, for example, who has operated an Elasticsearch cluster in scale and then try to re-index or scale up and down the cluster will understand that this is not a trivial task, right? You need some really good knowledge about it, and you also need uh, the time and the resources to do this. So in this, in the case you have that, if you have the the superstars of Elastic and, and you have the resources to do it, maybe that's an option. If not, I would say you go with a pro proprietary solution, a service like CoreLogix, and, and then this task is, 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 is just taken over by the vendor, right? You don't have to think about scaling it, changing it, back upping it, all these things. So I think that would be kind of my answer is proprietary or open source. I would say on the data side, open source is definitely a really, really good uh, solution for observability. On the, on the backend side, I, I would really suggest uh, going with the vendor except you have some really, really uh, uh, knowledgeable people who understand how to do it. Uh, uh, Ariel, how is it for you? I mean, yeah. you're operating your platform on scale and, and you know how hard it is. So, so what would yeah. you say? I definitely, if we go back to the, the, the home uh, analogy, it's like doing your own uh, electricity work. If you're great at it, go ahead. But if not, you got to be careful. Uh, <laughs> I will add two components to this. So definitely agree on the, the collection layer. One other thing that we're trying to do is to keep the query language uh, to have uh, APIs and pluggability of other open source tools, just because it helps ramping up in terms of uh, observability culture. A lot of the people that will join an organization will already know the query language and how to operate a dashboard, and that helps them ramp up. Um, and there, another thing that I wanted to add is there's something in the middle um, that not many people understand the, 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 difference, the difference between that and SaaS. There's open source that you deploy on your own. There's SaaS, the high end, which is like Instana or CoreLogix. But in the middle, there's these hosted services. So if you take like hosted Elastic by Amazon, it's great. Um, it's Elastic and it's built for you and the server's there, but it's definitely not SaaS. So, if there's a scaling uh, problem, it's your problem. If there's mapping problem, it's your problem, and so on and so forth. So I think that that middle case makes you basically not gain full control, not pay less, and not get full SaaS. So the question is between full open source and SaaS, and I agree with you, it really depends on one, the scale, two, how much it distracts you from your business, and three, the, 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 the skill set that you have. because I'm looking at, and I guess any company here, anyone hiring, and probably you also, Mirko, it is very hard to hire strong engineers. The competition on engineers is very, is extremely hard. And if you have that team that is strong, back-end, performance-oriented, analytics team, and they're busy maintaining Elk and Prometheus and uh, uh, Jaeger, then you're just missing out a lot of talent in your company that can push your uh, business forward and you probably want to outsource that. Totally agree with that. So let's step, I see more questions coming in. So let's step to the next question. We, we mentioned a lot of culture. What's your advice in getting the leadership or higher business buy in to get observer on a team? I, I, I can tell you something as a vendor. Uh, when we go out and sell in Stana, we have a few qualification questions. And one of them is pain, right? And, and I have learned something, if it comes to cultural change or any change with, with anything in life, people will normally not change until there is pain, right? So, I, I mean, I'll give you an example. I'm in Germany here and, and we were not, not really good in remote work, right? And we, we most of the organizations were really, really uh, against it, right? And then we had COVID and like in a week, Every company changed and allowed remote working, which was not possible for years, right? And everybody used uh, team meetings. And, and and what I want to say, we had pain, right? The pain was covered that we had to work from home. And, and, that, and in that case, people changed, right? And I think it's very similar 
in organizations, how, how can you really get your leadership? I think it's really hard to, to, to try to change if you don't have a problem, right? I think the right timing for getting that is if your system ran out of business, you had an issue and you couldn't really resolve it in five minutes, it took hours and you, you lost revenue or something, that's the time when you can explain to your leadership, hey, if we would have observability in place, if you have allowed me to invest in that, I would have fixed that problem in five minutes, right? And, and now it took us two days and we lost so much revenue reputation because we didn't have it in place. So I think whenever you see the opportunity to explain that this could have prevented something, and I know that you could also try it the other way around and go up front and say, if we would invest this amount of money into development, into tools, and then we could prevent it in the future, a lot of people say, oh, we never had the problem. Uh, I, pain is really the main driver for change, right? And so I would say, if you want to change, just wait, right? Pain will always come. If, if you're in a software business, software systems fail always. And, and, and that's the right timing, right? Also a good timing to meet a customer, America. Um, <laughs> I'll, give, I'll give a different perspective on this. I agree with what you're saying, but I'll give a different perspective if you wanna, if you wanna go ahead and, and try to be proactive on this in, in your organization. It's, it's, it's some sort of like psychological question, but what I do is I would try to not point out the bad um, because if you tell someone, you know, we don't have observability now, but you don't want to wait for this to, for something for a crisis to happen. Most of the business leaders will be like, okay, but you know, my business is doing pretty well. So unless I'm seeing something else, like Mirko mentioned, I'm not going to to shift. But if you explain them the, the benefits that they'll get, how can this affect their top line? They might be more open to this. Like we can um, focus more efforts of engineering and creating, and then we can create more products. We can release faster. We can uh, promise a higher SLA to our customers. We can charge more. We can be uh, more compliant with a lot of the uh, uh, compliance standards that uh, will open up new markets for us. Um, these are things that business leaders take into account. And then they ask, okay, how much is going to cost my business to enter, I don't know, the government sector in the US? And you say with proper observability, probably like $300,000 a year, and that opens up $30 billion market for you guys. Uh, a lot of business leaders will, will probably not do this urgently, but if you uh, keep mentioning that, at some point they might say, go ahead and do it. Last question I have here on the list is, can you add observability to existing system or does it have to build in? And uh, I, I mean, you like analogies. I have an analogy here too. I, I'm not sure if you remember when uh, unit tests became popular, right? So uh, basically testing. And at that time, there was the same question, right? Does it make sense to add unit tests to an existing system where you didn't have unit tests or does it only make sense to have it in like newly directly built in, right? And I think the answer that, that everybody came to over time, and I think it's very similar with observability is that it doesn't really make sense if you have a system that has no observability to just like go from zero to 100% right away, right? It, I think what makes sense is to really iteratively add observability to these uh, 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 existing systems, right? When needed and for what you need it. Similar to when you said you, you shouldn't just add unit tests to an existing system, but if you change something or if you have a problem, then you add the unit test at that point of time. So I would say, first of all, yes, you can add observability to existing systems and you should. What I think you shouldn't do, and it's really hard also to argue, is just say, I make a big project and make all my uh, uh, existing sy systems observable, that's that's really hard, right? And by the way, I see the second question, which is kind of aligned with this, right? Reactive versus proactive. And I think that's a really good analogy, right? If you build a system fresh, I would be proactive, right? Build it right in. If you have an existing system without uh, 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 observability in it, be reactive, right? If you have a problem and you don't have the observability in, 
now put it in so the next time you need it, you have it in place, right? So that, that would be my answer, right? I mean, I know you could do it right away too, but I also know in reality, that's a really tough project. Yeah, I, I agree. Two things that I want to add to this. One is I would go for minimum observability in all my older systems. You don't have to get full, but if we go back to the home analogy, you don't want the alarm system covering 50% of the place. So you want to have something minimal, and then exactly like Mirko said, go ahead and whenever you need it, add more layers. And a data-driven way to do that is even if you don't have observability in your legacy systems, you probably have monitoring of some sort. Go back to the alerts that you received, check out the hot areas where you had more uh, uh, alerting and more problems happening. Most of engineers, experienced engineers, will already know what are the hot areas in your system and go add, go start with them. And then obviously, I agree, anything new that you build, be proactive, build it, observe it, and it's a lot about, it connects to the, the previous uh, question, it's a lot about the culture. Create that culture in your organization because if you only start patching and new applications are not 100% observable, you would have a hard time uh, implementing this uh, culture. Right, and if, if, if it comes to proactive, reactive, I also think maybe in small companies, but in bigger companies, define standards and kind of architecture for observability too, right? Because what we see a lot, if you just let observability go, different teams will use different set of tags, will use different set of like uh, IDs, and that makes observability really hard if it comes to merging things together, right? So I think it makes sense to set a few standards, right? What do you want to observe, right? Where do you want to put in logs? Where do you want to put in traces? Where do you utilize metrics? How much of that do you want to have for this minimum, even proactively? And also, how do you want to basically tag these things, right? Which things do you want to have in your logs? How do you identify logs? How do you merge them, right? You, you talked about merging patterns and, and these things. So I, I really think that if you go that observability path, really spend some time with your, I don't know how you name it, right? Architecture team, tech leadership team, whatever, to define a few best practices and a few standards from the beginning, because otherwise it's it's really set up for failure, right? You will have a lot of data that, that's very hard to correlate and, and use. So it makes sense to use it. And some vendors even provide a framework like we do uh, uh, how to how to use it and, 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 and you can integrate into that framework. But if not, really, really define a few standards to make sure that uh, the data makes sense and that you are collecting. Yeah, I think uh, it, a lot of the times when people talk about reactive and proactive, they think about monitoring. Like, do you have like anomaly detection or other stuff? Uh, reactive and proactive observability is a lot about how you do things um, yeah. and how you implement the measures. Implementing the observability measures that you need ahead is being proactive. Being, um, having this culture in your organization and, and the right way to encourage and ask the right questions on the data, even if everything's okay. Just being able to come in the morning and ask, how are the relationships between this microservices and this one? What's changed from last night? What's changed from last version? And being able to be proactive about this, this is what, what is creating a, a, a proactive observability. Ariel, I have one, one last question, right? I wanted to ask this question 30 minutes ago, but this, this is really great. I love when we have this uh, interactive mode here and people yeah. ask questions, but you said the brain of a human was not built for metrics. Uh, can you, we have a minute left. Can you explain that? That, I, that stuck with me and yeah. uh, I'm good in numbers. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, matrix is not about numbers. Matrix is, is about a single event at a point of time. So being able to tell you, boom, something broke, something's down, something has high CPU, something has high memory. People are built to digest stories. When you give someone a service map, and he sees, oh, this is talking to this, and then this is replying here, and this took longer, then he's starting to build this story in his head and this hypothesis. And when he starts reading the logs and saying, this system acts as this system and got a denial because of one, two, three, and he's saying, oh, this might be related to keys rotations that I've uh, uh, done, 
and then he goes through the previous changes in production, you start building this story. And you, you, you mentioned postmortems. A postmortem is a story, right? Yes. This happened, and then we saw this parameter, and then we saw this matrix, and this, this alert happened, and then customers complain. This is how the human brain was, like people remember stories if you think about yourself reading a bunch of bullet lines uh, rather than hearing someone telling you a story about this, you'd remember the story and you'd be able to complete that story or give the next chapter a lot easier. Um, Makes and sense. Creating good observability measures and being able to ask the right questions lets you build the story of your system or the incident. Yeah, thank you. So. Ariel, that was super fun and super fast. I, uh, I, uh, I, I liked it and very, I mean, I really have to say thank you to the audience with these great questions, making it interactive, challenging us with some tough questions here. Ariel was super fun. Thanks everyone joining this session. We have more to come and uh, I, I really enjoyed it here. Thanks, Ariel. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much, Mirko, for having me. And thanks, uh, the great audience, for all the awesome questions that were better than our slides. So uh, thanks a lot, guys. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. Bye-bye. Jario and Mirko, for your time today. Um, we are at the end of our meeting now. The a link will be present to you for an on-demand webinar, or you can visit our website to access the recording. You can also check out our other upcoming webinars by visiting instana.com forward slash webinars. Thank you all very much for joining us today and for your wonderful questions. Have a good day.